Okay, it is 7.01. So we can go ahead and get started and I'm sure people are going to start rolling in. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Maddie uh, from Mad DIY Marketing and I want to thank you so much for joining this episode, Emerging Local Markets in New Orleans. This episode is a part of the Digital Shelf series a series created in collaboration with Fund 17, Propeller, Recirculating Farms Coalition, Food Policy Advisory Committee, and Mad DIY Marketing. We created this series to bring food businesses together to discuss how we can adjust and adapt to a more digital shelf space that COVID-19 has placed a lot of food businesses. Tonight, our presenters will be discussing emerging direct-to-consumer, home delivery, consumer pickups, and individual weekly programs as options for selling your packaged products. We're joined by Marianne Couffon from Recirculating Farms Coalition, Connor Delache from Top Box, Louisiana, and Sharon Flowers and Spencer from Bypass Lines. We are so happy that y'all can join us. Thank you. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Please remember to keep your microphones on mute. This episode will be recorded, so please be aware of this. We will also be hosting a Q&A session at the end of this episode. So please hold your questions until the end and we will get them answered. Thank you so much for your attention. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Mary Ann Couffon from Recirculating Farms Coalition. Mary Ann, take it away. Thanks so much. Uh, hi everybody, good evening. I hope you're doing well. Um, I wanted to introduce our organization. Um, so I'm Mary Ann Couffon, I'm the Executive Director of Recirculating Farms. We're a national nonprofit organization headquartered in New Orleans, Louisiana. And we work on a number of different programs here um, we run the Growing Local Farms, uh, which are in Central City. We have a number of lots there. We do policy advocacy work to support farmers and gr other growers. Um, we do farm garden trainings. And we do weekly affordable local garden bags. And that's really the part I'm planning to focus on this evening. Um, what our bags look like, how we sell them, um, and marketing basically of those. Um, so our bags include fresh local vegetables, fruits, herbs, and something special uh, additional. We do what's called the lanyap item, which is from excess produce or fruits that we get during the week. Um, and we make jam or salsa or pesto or pickles or just about anything. We've done fresh juices um, and that's included in our bags. So when we first started this, we used to have our own weekly CSA, um, Community Supported Agriculture, where people bought into the shares every week and they came and picked up their bags on a weekly basis. They would sign up in advance for the whole season, uh, but pay by the week. We were trying to make it affordable for the community to not have to pay a big chunk of money in advance. Um, however, there were a lot of challenges with the CSA model. Uh, people didn't come and pick up their bags, and so we would have picked excess food and we would donate it, but it still felt very wasteful. We would spend a lot of time waiting for people to come pick up their bags. And at the time, we weren't allowed to sell food directly from our garden space. So we had to find a different location to meet people. And it just felt weird. You know, we would meet people in the street and be like, psst, psst, we've got some kale. Um, so it wasn't very professional. So we got very lucky and connected with Top Box Foods, Louisiana and started selling on a weekly basis uh, online and they handled all of the business transactions. And for us, that was really perfect. We were able to focus on farming and growing and doing all of the other things that we do in our organization, um, working on policy advocacy and growing our farms and doing farmer trainings. And they took care of the business end of things. And the way that has been working is they on their website, which you'll see later, um, have a way for people to individually order our bags. 
uh, online. And then we, at the end of the week, know the number of bags, we harvest the food that needs to go into the bags, or we aggregate it from other farms if we don't have enough. And then we take that food to their facility where we then pack it into our individual bags and then they deliver it for us each week. And so this has been working really well. Um, it has made our lives infinitely easier. We do a lot of the promotional work jointly, but we ourselves promote it through our newsletters and social media. We do it in person at farmers markets and different events. Um, but all of the all of the ordering is actually still digital. And um, so that in and of itself is a little bit of a challenge. Um, we can't reach everyone digitally and um, and some people don't have access to internet. And so we've been trying to figure out how to make the ordering more equitable to reach more people. The entire purpose of our bag is to market local, affordable, fresh food. So meaning um, it's meant to provide access to fresh food for people who might otherwise have low access or are in low income areas. Um, so being able to reach our ideal audience um, has been somewhat challenging and we've been you know, working with a bunch of people to try and overcome these challenges. One of the things we've done is implement a food access table at the refresh market on Mondays and also it will be at some of the other local markets. Um, we thought if we met people where they are quite literally at stores or groceries, farmers markets, medical facilities, um, it would be a good way of reaching them with these bags. And so we're still not taking in-person orders, but we are collecting people's names and telling them that we're out there and assisting with the online access. So some of the other challenges we've had um, using this model has been, sometimes it's difficult to plan on a week by week basis. So you have to be able to know how many bags you're getting and a few days later, um, harvest the food or order food and then um, pack and have it delivered. And so when you're moving on that fast of a timeline, it can be challenging for farming, right? Because things don't take just a week to grow. They take 30, 60, 90 days. Um, so you have to plan in advance. And my best advice there is about knowing your customer base, right? We did extensive um, surveying of our customer base. We keep in touch with the people who regularly order from us. And we've learned over time that um, people want certain things, they don't want certain things, they like things done in a particular way. And so my, my best advice for marketing local products is to know your customers, get to know your customers in a personal way. And even though we do our ordering online, we're very much in, in touch with our customers. So um, how people can get involved with us, for those of you who market products, we do include local products in our bags every week. Um, and we have purchased things from other people. We don't always have enough food at our own farms for various reasons. Um, and so we do aggregate from other people. And so if you have fresh local items or value added items, we're interested. We've purchased local honey, we've purchased local pickles, jams, all of those things go into our bags. Uh, and if you're a grower like us, we also buy local food to um, plump up the bags when we can't. Um, when we, when we don't have enough food to offer. Um, so I guess that's probably, I'll stop there. And uh, if people have questions, we can talk about it. And I will kick it over to Connor to talk more about how Topbox works and, uh, and, and how they handle their marketing. Thank you so much, Marianne. And thank you, Maddie, for having me and all of us together today. Um, I, so I guess first and foremost, I'm the executive director of Top Box Foods. Um, I came down to New Orleans in 2013 to help found Top Box Foods here in New Orleans. Um, and I kind of want to just go back to square one and kind of talk about where we started um, and what our roots were and then kind of shift into where we are now. 
Um, Top Box was founded primarily as a hunger relief organization. Um, we saw there was obviously a huge gap um, between, you know, food that was being donated and grocery stores and where food was actually accessible and affordable in our communities. Um, so our goal was to create a system that basically cut out all overhead costs associated with getting groceries to people uh, who needed it and then make that food accessible in areas that didn't have access uh, to fresh food. Um, so focusing primarily on, you know, what we might consider the working poor, people who are working honest livings, working honest jobs, but still facing really difficult decisions uh, in regards to their budget and their finances on a daily basis. Um, so we established a system that um, sells boxes of fresh produce and frozen meats um, at about 40% retail price. Uh, and we partnered with community organizations like churches, uh, community centers, libraries, um, you name it, anybody who wanted to partner. Um, that basically was, you know, kind of like a centralized location for people to come pick up this food. Um, we would partner with them and then facilitate uh, drop off windows every weekend uh, where people who have pre ordered the boxes could come and pick up their food. Uh, one of the key differences between top box and what you might think of when you think of a traditional CSA, uh, we don't require prepayment for our boxes. So one of the things that's really important for, for people who are living on a budget and might be, might be living paycheck to paycheck is that, you know, CSA sometimes requires as much as six months advance pay to participate. Um, we don't want to lock people in like that. And we don't want to ask people to front any sort of cost or fee that they can't afford. So, uh, our website allows customers to place orders um, and traditionally show up to those pickup locations uh, to pick up their box and pay at that time. So if they don't or are not able to pay or show up for some reason, uh, we would then actually take the box that we prepared for them uh, and partner with second chance organizations um, who are able to take that food and then utilize it in another way or worst case scenario, put it into compost. Um, so that would be the Making Groceries program. Uh, a, few year, a few years later, uh, we just tried to think about ways in which we could further uh, kind of establish access to fresh produce in these pockets of New Orleans that we knew didn't have access. Uh, and we began the Healthy Corner Store Collaborative, which was a way for us to uh, lend our supply chain uh, to corner stores who uh, weren't carrying produce, for primarily two reasons. One, there was kind of a preconceived notion that people in certain areas don't want produce and wouldn't buy it. Um, and another is that the corner stores themselves were forced to buy caseloads of produce, um, which oftentimes could be a financial burden because if they can't sell that entire caseload, uh, they can take a loss. Um, so it wasn't profitable for them. So what we did was we helped, we worked with corner stores to basically establish what their demand was and then we collectivized all the stores that we worked with, we collectivized their demand um, so that they could all individually access only the amount of produce that they could support. Uh, so now produce is profitable for them. They're not taking a loss on waste uh, and they're able to sell back to the community at affordable rates. Uh, one of the things we saw in the first uh, year of the program is that close to 80% of the produce that we put into stores uh, sold in the first week that it was there. So kind of dispelling that notion that there are people within areas who don't want produce. Um, it's really not that, it's not, a lack, it's not a lack of desire, it's a lack of affordability and accessibility. Um, so from there, um, as Marianne mentioned, we also started thinking about, you know, how can we start incorporating local produce uh, from our roots beginning in, um, with hunger relief as kind of like our primary focus and trying to create affordability Local produce to us seemed like something that maybe wasn't an option uh, for our customers, but we gathered pretty quickly that there is a significant demand regardless of your economic status or financial status that people want to support local growers, local producers, and they're interested in paying for local produce. So RFC and, and Top Box kind of joined up to uh, basically offer their harvest and their yield in the RFC bag on our website and um, we pretty much sell out whatever we can put on our website. Um, so that was a really great uh, kind of step in the right direct direction for us in terms of trying to figure out, you know, what can we do to utilize our platform to kind of localize our food system 
Um, we do truly believe, uh, you know, if you look at the beginning of the pandemic, it's very clear that our current food system is not set up uh, to support our communities. It is very fragile. We had maybe a couple of our large distributors go down as a result of the pandemic and um, infection problems. And we saw grocery stores that had entire shelves empty. Um, that's just not a sustainable system. And we really do believe, and I know Marianne believes as well, that we need to take steps towards localizing our food system, diver diversifying our suppliers and our producers um, so that we're not really reliant upon one large distributor who controls the market. Um, so in the beginning of the pandemic, what we did um, in an effort to kind of make a, a more safe approach for how people could do their grocery shopping, as opposed to having people come to uh, a centralized location and pick up their boxes, we established and developed what we now run um, is our home delivery system. So we're actually delivering directly to people's doors um, within a, a boundary. And I guess I could kind of take you over to our website to show that boundary. Um, but we saw a, an incredible amount of um, interest and, sorry, multitasking and talking, not my forte apparently. Bring you over here. Is everyone seeing my screen? Okay, so this is our home delivery zone. Um, we have a very wide range. Obviously, our goal is to expand beyond uh, Causeway out to the east, um, hopefully soon. Um, but for now, we're covering a, a pretty wide range of territory. And the way we uh, determined this was basically based off of where our existing partnerships were. So all of the community partners um, that were participating in Top Box before uh, are encompassed in this uh, delivery zone. Um, within the first few weeks, we had about a 700% increase in sales of our boxes. Um, and as I mentioned, we also kind of, you know, woke up a little bit more in terms of how important localizing our food system is. And we use this as an opportunity to support all the local farmers who no longer had, uh, you know, access to farmers markets or who supplied restaurants before and restaurants weren't buying from them. So there were a lot of farmers who really had no avenues to sell their food. Um, so we started working in addition to recirculating farms, we started working with Sprout and Market Umbrella and direct with a lot of farmers uh, and producers um, in the New Orleans and, and greater New Orleans area uh, to basically support their products on our website. We said to them, you know, we are delivering food daily directly to people's homes. Um, if you're looking for an avenue to sell, look no further, uh, we have you covered. So uh, we set up a system where farmers can either participate in the RFC box or participate in the Crescent City Farmers Market box or um, work directly with, the, with us to put their product on our menu. Um, and, you know, the idea of a home delivery system itself, um, if we're looking at it as a business standpoint, from a business standpoint, is not entirely sustainable. Um, it obviously costs a lot more to deliver to directly to people's homes than it does to kind of funnel, you know, a lot of people into one location in a short period of time. Um, but we've seen that people really want this service and we are determined to figure out a way to continue pr to provide it. Um, we've been very fortunate with uh, grant funding, um, partially in thanks to Marianne and her efforts. Um, but we've been fortunate to have some grant funding that has kind of covered this learning period for us. Um, and the goal is to really create sustainability around this, this system. Um, I wanted to bring you to our website because uh, ordering with us is really simple. Uh, you come to our website, you can go on our shop uh, and you can see all of our offerings on here. Um, these are our two staples. These are the two boxes that we started with, our fruit box and our veggie box. We will forever have them and they will forever be $20. Um, if you go to the grocery store and you pull out all the products that we put in a fruit box, um, it might cost you anywhere from $35 to $50, depending on the store that you go to. Um, and our goal, as I mentioned, is to not just uh, kind of work with these bigger distributors to uh, do bulk purchasing to fill these boxes, but now to also start working with the farmers that we've created relationships with uh, to start supplementing their, their produce, not just in 
our growing local garden box, which is the RFC facilitated box or the Crescent City Farmers Market box, but get their produce into our consistent fruit and vegetable box that are offered every single day as well. Um, other things that we have done or that we are including, you can see here we have local rice, we're starting to add eggs. Um, we have local ribs from a farm uh, just north of New Orleans. Um, so really trying to expand our offerings and support as many people who are interested in, in using us as a platform to sell their food as possible. Um, as I mentioned, ordering is pretty easy. Um, you select a box, you can go to our the checkout page. Um, and the cool thing is that if um, you are someone who is using EBT or if you're not prepared to pay, uh, we have an option in our checkout menu that allows you to basically bypass our payment portal. Um, so, you know, it's, it's better for us and for everyone a little bit more easy if people pay online, but um, we understand that that's not always an option for everybody. Uh, and one of the perks that we add to organizations like RFC or to farmers who are looking, farmers or producers who are looking for different avenues is that we're able to market their offerings uh, to people who are utilizing food stamps, um, EBT, SNAP benefit. Um, so people like that, you can't actually do that online um, if you're using EBT. So you can bypass the payment page entirely. And then we follow up with every customer directly uh, to get that payment. Um, I think I have talked about everything that I have for now. Um, I'm sure there are questions or things that I will remember when someone else, when Sharon starts talking. Um, so for now, I think I will put a pause on it there um, and save the rest for questions. Um, so I'll turn it over to Sharon and Spencer. Thank you, Connor. Um, that, that I learned something new today. I honestly didn't. I've heard of Top Box. And the first time I heard the name, I thought of the little uh, things that Box you have to tip out. <laughs> So um, you certainly have enlightened me uh, tremendously, not only about the name and what you guys do, but I, I mean, I love fruits and vegetables and I buy it every week. That's a weekly thing for me. So now that I know about it, like where would I go to pick up? Where are you guys located? So our operation is all run out of Liberty's Kitchen on Broad. They're a very close oh, part okay. of ours and we do a lot of things hand in hand with them. Uh, but as I mentioned, we are strictly home delivery now. So you place your order and we deliver it directly to your door. And it's a contact free delivery. So uh, we'll give you a, a two hour time window when we're going to drop off your, your order. And then we will shoot you a text when it's there and you can open up your door and get it. And our driver wow. will be That's way awesome. away from you at that point. So $20 plus tax and you get it delivered at your door. No tax, no delivery fee. Wow. Yeah, that's a deal. I'm sold. Well, I will keep an eye out for your order. And if you want a small <laughs> local box, you would go to, to ours, which is the Growing Local Garden Bag. Growing Local Garden Bag. Okay, I have to look for that one too. Okay, so I see Spencer's smiling face is on. Um, I'll just dive in. This is a really good segue. Uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's similar to Top Box at all, but we have an online, uh, ordering system and mobile app system. So I'm Sharon Flowers Maple and you see Spencer Davis, we both are the co-founders of Bypass Lines. And just to tell you a little bit about Bypass Lines, we, uh, the company was originated as design of technologies. And then when we saw the potential for where bypass lines could go, we said, you know what, let's just make it its own company. So we launched it this year, March, 2020, right before COVID, right before they said, let's shut down everything. <laughs> um, but we, we've been managing and pivoted a little bit and um, we, we're doing okay. But as I mentioned, uh, it's mobile ordering. So customers could go uh, on their phone and pull up an app or they can go to a website and uh, we are local based. And I guess just before, because the next slide kind of gets into who, who's it for. So it's mobile ordering of food, of uh, retail items. So let's say if you want to buy a candle, if you want to buy pants, if you want to pick up dinner, um, you can go in the app or online and 
schedule to purchase all of those out. So who's it for and who's it not for? We're looking at it from the merchant standpoint. So this would be, this platform would be ideal for like restaurants, retailers, caterers, bakers, um, and independent product providers. So selling like um, seasoning, for example. Um, and it's not for businesses that do not have an EIN because we have to establish a merchant account and the payment processor requires um, someone to have an EIN. So if you're working out your home, that's fine. It's just, we have to have the EIN number. Um, for businesses that are service only, uh, it's not for them. You have to have a product. And then businesses selling products that's ready for a same date is ideal. Because usually people are going into the app, ordering, paying for it, and then picking it up. Although we have, we do have some scheduling. Folks can schedule out a week. So anything to add there, Spencer? No, I think you captured it. Okay. So what are the benefits to the end user or the customers? So as I was mentioning, customers can order food and non-food items. So it can be from um, a boutique store or a gift shop or any place when you think of a line or people congregating and waiting to check out, for example. Um, and customers can pay online or in the app. And as I mentioned, it just reduces them having to wait uh, in line to pick up their items. So when you think of someone who's going to a restaurant, for example, usually there's prep time. So you show up, you gotta wait in line, you place your order, they have to cook the food. So it just eliminates and reduce waiting and it reduce um, the contact of uh, having to exchange card, your credit card and sign and uh, exchange the pens. So it's kind of a contactless way to purchase items. The benefits to merchants are um, many of the, the merchants, like in the restaurant industry, usually their primary means of getting customer orders are through phone. So it kind of reduced the phone ringing. Um, it also helps with coordinating in-house delivery because the platform has a ability to, for the customer to select delivery and put in their location. So if the restaurant or the boutique is offering delivery, then we can capture that information from the customer. And again, contactless purchases, they don't have to exchange pens, papers, cards, um, they, the customers pay in the app. And then um, it's a, a great way if the merchant has a website to bring traffic uh, to their website. Oftentimes, if we're looking up um, a boutique or a restaurant, we may go to their website to try to order. Um, and sometimes you do not see a way to order like from a restaurant. Um, it may list Grubhub and Uber Eats or some other delivery company, but you can't just hit order now. So we help to facilitate that. So we I'm wanted to share. For, I'm gonna pause okay. for a second, Sharon, if you go back sure. there. Um, yeah. For that last uh, bullet where, um, what's interesting about uh, when converting website traffic, um, almost eight, almost 70% of people that are looking for something to buy from a retailer, they, they go to that, that particular retailer's website. And a lot of times they don't, um, if they're looking for, looking for something, they're looking for the ability to buy, um, opposed to going to a third party. So we have that option of being able to do a order now button, but we also have the ability to embed inside of their website. So they don't have to necessarily be transitioned to another site. So we almost um, automatically transform their site into an e-commerce site overnight. So it's not something that's built out, um, an extreme build out or all this extra cost or you know, mm -hmm. hundreds of dollars for folks that otherwise can't afford it, it, it becomes an affordable option and they can keep their branding in place, which I like, which, which I, I think most retailers like, is that they're trying to build their brand and not, and not uh, if you notice with a lot of the other um, third party platforms, in order for folks to know about them, they have to shout them out on Instagram or 
on Facebook and say, hey, go all over here. That's where my stuff is. So we try to at least help the small and local businesses keep their branding in place so that folks can experience what they have and what they have to offer. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we wanted to share some lessons learned um, in trying to pivot and build the business. Um, one thing that we have learned is uh, refining your message um, to what the needs are when you're talking to uh, a merchant or you're trying to partner. It's it's finding that that pain point for them and you providing you being that complement to um the pain point or the solution for their pain and going in addressing that pain point directly we find is more um uh successful of a conversation than going in like most people want to like saying hey we got this thing we got this platform and you should get on it because it's great um yeah, anything you want to add to that, Spencer? No, I think you're, that's, that's exactly the point of that, okay. that message, yeah. I'll let you talk about customer service. Yeah, well, for me, um, I've always felt like customer service is dead. And, and that's basically because it's, folks talk about customer service, they place it inside of their mantra, they place it inside of their message and their, and their pamphlets but it's not there. Folks are not smiling. They're not saying thank you. They're not saying, um, we really appreciate your, 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 your dollars. They're not sending, uh, you know, they want feedback, but it's not a personal touch. And, and folks, you know, back in the day, it's one of those things where folks want to feel like they're valued. Um, and that's what, per, that's what customer service really is, is going above and beyond. And, and look, every dollar matters, right? Um, every customer matters. And I will tell you that every negative comment for one person affects 10 people, right? And that's, to me, regardless of anything else, you can have the greatest product on the planet. But if you don't have, if you have rotten customer service, nobody's coming back to you. So I, I just believe um, that it's paramount to loyalty, folks coming back, folks frequently frequenting your uh, and, and buying your product. And if you don't have it, if you have a, if you have to have an attitude adjustment and just, you know, you have to have one. <laughs> if you're going to be in the service industry or providing products, I, I don't know any other way to say it, but you got to, you got to almost bite your lip and just smile and, and say, I really appreciate you. Even to the rude guy that doesn't like the fruit you that, that said that your fruit was bruised and it wasn't right, you got to say, hey, I, look, let's, how about this? The next apple that falls from the tree is coming to you. <laughs> so it's just one of those things that I, and I'm going to take this one moment just to say that if that's not a part of the, the foundation of your business, um, it's, yeah, I don't know how long you will last. I just think that customer service is important um, on every level. It's almost like a safety hazard thing. <laughs> so that's, I just wanted to make that point. Thanks. Um, and not taking no for an answer. And what we mean by this is not harassing somebody and <laughs> stalking them until they say yes, just in the grand scheme of things, um, not taking notes for, for, for an answer. So what I mean by this is, I, I think for like every 30 to 40 no's we get, we get one yes. <laughs> uh, in terms of onboarding, approaching restaurants and boutiques and whether it's calling or what I call door knocking, but going to the actual place of business and saying, hey, are you interested? Um, oftentimes we're, we're, we're told no, not now or we have something, you know, there's a, a lot of the reasons why people choose not to sign on, but we just never know if that next person's gonna say yes. So it's just kind of a, a motivating thing to just keep going um, as you're trying to build your business. And then just the power, lastly, the power of social media 
um, as a whole, but also specifically, uh, I don't know how many people are a part of like Facebook groups, but that was a way for us to gain some followers and um, meet some folks who are interested in our product. Um, I think we mastered that so well that I, in my mind, like Facebook just shut us down. They're like, no, they're being too successful with this because we were able to, we had 300 followers on Facebook and we were able to double that number in one week. And then after that week, we just didn't get any visibility. Like they just tuned us down <laughs> that no one could see like comments and postings, but um, it certainly served the purpose. Um, and it's certainly a way to, for people to, to, to know about you and learn about you and for you to connect with other entrepreneurs. Um, and then the influencers, the power of influencers. Um, that's a new terminology for me in the sense that I just learned that terminology. Um, it feels like it was this year, I guess it was last year, but these are folks who are on social media who may have like 20,000 followers or 50,000 followers and they're people who will buy what they recommend. So if the influencers are, are, are um, promoting a burger at a particular place, there are folks that see that and, you know, gonna make it their point to go buy the same burger. So just wanted to share that for those uh, who may not have heard of influencers. Uh, let's see, I think. Okay, so this is just our contact information. Um, certainly appreciate you connecting with us. If you want to follow us on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, we're in all three of those social medias. And then certainly download the app if you are hungry or <laughs> just want to explore what uh, merchants are on there. Uh, we do have an app both in uh, the Apple Store and the Google Play Stores and that you can order online from online.bypasslines.com or in the app. Anything there, Spencer? Uh, it was a pleasure. Yes, yes. So yeah, thank you, Maddie, for the opportunity. That's all we have. Do you wanna take questions at this time or let me stop sharing? Yeah, um, yeah. I think that would be wonderful if anyone has any questions you can have the option to unmute yourself and um, ask your question or feel free to send it through the chat whatever you are comfortable with I'm actually going to ask Sharon a question if that's okay um, and Spencer did, did y'all do this before COVID started? Like, was this um, in advance of the pandemic or is this as a result of the pandemic? This is like a two year project. We birthed a child, which we birthed a giraffe. How long did, what's the gestational period for a giraffe? <laughs> um, but it, it took about two years to launch the product. It just so happened to coincide with um, releasing just before COVID. Talk about fortuitous timing. I know, right? Yeah. But what's so interesting, um, Marianne, is that we thought, wow, this is perfect. COVID, not perfect. Not COVID, not perfect. Mm -hmm. But this is perfect timing in that um, contactless um, pickup should be like a thing like people should be super excited about this and what we found when we were going to the restaurants is they felt like this was not the time that it was a time of uncertainty they weren't sure what the governor was what decision that the governor was going to make as it relates to you know moving from one phase to another phase um, but we were told by a lot of merchants that uh, they rather wait until COVID is over and they want to see what happens with COVID before they make any decisions to add something new. So, you know, it, I think um, intellectually it makes sense, but in actuality, we were surprised to see that um, it wasn't as easy as we thought it would be. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I was so 
pleased that we and Topbox had worked this thing out. I mean, we'd been doing it for years, but it, but the pandemic really caused us to, uh, I don't want to say perfect, that's a very strong word, but um, clean up what we were doing and, and figure out um, ways to do things in the new world that we were living in. And especially Connor and everybody figuring out the at-home deliveries. You know, previously we were all having all of our things go to a certain locations and people were coming and picking them up. And so I think the at-home deliveries have been really a game changer for, for everyone. Certainly for us, I mean, we saw our sales quadruple. Uh, and I know Connor, yours went up way a lot too, right? During the pandemic. Yeah, I think in total we have had like a about a 1200% increase in sales. Wow, um, that's awesome. Yeah, we went from about 300, 300 to 400 households a month that were accessing top box um, to at times double that in a week. Wow. Uh, we've kind of leveled out um, since like the initial first couple months, um, but we're still right now steady at about 400 households a, a week. Um, and I will just add on, like, I don't know if forcing us to perfect it is, is necessarily the right word. I think we're still always learning right. and always making adjustments on the fly and figuring out what we can do better. Uh, I know at least in our position and, and as far as RFC is concerned, you know, localizing our food system is a massive complex issue. So we're always going to be working towards that, but it definitely forced us to take a lot of steps very fast. Um, and we're really fortunate to have had that opportunity. It was um, trying to route 700 deliveries across three trucks in a couple of days is something that uh, was very new to me to say the least. So like just trying to figure out what kind of software would work. Um, but it was, it was an incredible learning experience and you know, we figure out what we're doing and we have a pretty good system now um, and I bring this up to say that like for us, one of the biggest concerns in an ongoing basis now is something that you alluded to Spencer and that's customer service. Um, you know, we had a, a small, like a, a much smaller operation running and we were really, you know, we were able to be very diligent about what was going out the door. And I think anytime you are working with produce specifically or food for that matter in general, um, quality is always going to be a concern. And, you know, you can look at, you, you talked about apples, you can look at an apple or you can look at a peach and it looks aesthetically great, but if someone bites into it and, you know, sour or, it, you know, doesn't, it's bitter, it doesn't taste good, it's fibery, you know, there's all these things that you can't tell just from looking. So even by uh, doing our best job, there's still always going to be customer service issues. Um, and that's one of the things that, you know, we pride ourselves on is doing what you said, you know, customer is essentially always right. And if someone has a bad experience with us, you know, we're, we, as you know, this, this shopping platform, like you all are, we're asking people to trust us with their shopping experience. You know, we're taking it completely out of their hands and saying, don't go to the store. Don't look at your food. We're just going to bring it to you. So it's so important, A, that we're really diligent um, and we do our we really put our best foot forward at all times to make sure we're delivering quality produce because it's like you said, you know, the second something goes wrong, that's a customer who is maybe ordering consistently who maybe is never going to order again because of one bad experience. Um, but if it does happen, making sure that we are doing everything to reconcile that situation, whether that is sending out in a whole new box, whether that is offering a discount or credit, um, and it all starts with your attitude. I think I can't stress this enough with the people on our team and, you know, I, I really have to commend them because they do a great job of it, but um, your attitude and how you are conveying the fact that we want to make it right. And this is not the way we do business um, is so important to just putting a, a customer's mind at ease, I think, and, and making them feel like, okay, maybe this was just a mistake. This is not their status quo. This is not their MO. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy you mentioned that. And I think it's just such a, such an important piece for anybody's business, especially when it when you're talking about food. Yeah, and it's painful. Um, it's painful and it's fearful because you you know um, it's painful in the fact that 
you know, it's difficult to hear something wrong when you've been working at something to be so right. And when someone finds a issue or flaw, it's painful. It's like, uh, what are you talking about? I mean, your first, your first inclination is to be defensive. I mean, that's every human nature. So being in business, you have to go against the grain and swallow it and see how you can make it right. Mm -hmm. I think um, Sharon always says, um, it's, it's how you recover, right? In, in whatever those issues or mistakes are. And that's, that's part of the, the mantra that we go in is how can we, how can we recover? What, what does that recovery looks like? And the, the better your recovery, the better the, the experience, the more likely, I don't, I don't want to say 100%, but the more likely they will come back, right? So um, I think the, 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 only, the, the only thing that I would say is that for us, um, you know, we, we had to come out in the sense that um, I guess adversity does bring on change. And when you said that, Marion, that, um, you know, coming out and having COVID hit and then having to kind of pivot and do a few things and was able to kind of migrate into the whole delivery to home and things like that, just think about it, right? What if everything kind of went okay to some degree? the growth factor probably wouldn't have been as exponential if that pain, that, that adversity wasn't there to create another, another aspect of your business. So I, I guess the only other thing I would tell folks on, on the call is that to stay flexible and, and stay in the sense of asking questions. Always be the one asking more questions than the people outside of your business. You should be asking more questions inside of your business than anybody, because that's where change occurs. And it's hard to see it, especially if the environment is a kind of okay, it's balanced. But just with COVID, when Connor said it, man, we pivoted and we were able to go 1200% in our business. And that's just saying, I'm not gonna quit. I'm gonna be creative and come up with something else. Although it was painful, Although it was unknowing and the future didn't look, it was kind of hazy, I'm sure. Uh, gray, you know, it's foggy where I'm going. Uh, I, thought, I, I thought that's, 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 uh, that's a hats off because a lot of folks are not willing to ask that question. What can we do next? Um, and, and that's the questions always. Just keep asking questions and stay flexible and creative. Um, those are the folks that, you know, that if, if they don't win, they're in the race. <laughs> yeah. And I think my, I think my team probably um, hates me for this, but I always say, you know, if you're comfortable and you're very, very content, you know, your, your days are very smooth, clock in at nine, clock out, out at five, we're probably not growing. That to me is a, is a red flag. Uh, we need to be pushing the envelope. We need to be creative. We need to be, constantly looking for better solutions. Um, and, you know, this was a, a much bigger and more abnormal shift and change and test. But um, yeah, you know, it's exciting. It, it is scary, um, but you have to keep, keep changing, keep, like you said, asking the questions and looking for the next, next thing to propel yourself um, and keep it exciting. We have a question in the chat from Lawless, and I believe the question is for all the presenters. Does the producer set the price and pass the cost on to the customer? So I guess this is if the producer is selling on your platform or gets put into your box or your bags, um, how does that work? How does the, does the producer set the price? Um, how, what is the customer paying for? So for Topbox, at least, typically what we try to do is um, set a price that allows us to purchase in bulk to kind of drop the price a little bit um, on our end so that we can factor in a small overhead charge to cover the cost of distribution um, and like the, the other few minimal things that go into getting food from our facility 
into this into someone's hands. Um, so we do upcharge a little bit from what retailers offer us, um, but the goal is that you know we're going to provide a lot of volume for that that producer. Uh, so at the end of the day, it should be cost effective. And so for us, we are the producer in a lot of instances. Um, and so we have set our bags at a particular price. And so we try to grow and purchase things that fit into that price. Um, we are a nonprofit, so I like to mention that. So our prices are significantly lower than for-profit people because we do get grant support to keep the prices low. Um, and we don't, we don't charge for labor. Our labor costs are not factored in. So this is just the price of the food and the product. Um, but yeah, the way we do it is we set one price and then try to shop to meet that price. And that's why we love working with RFC. Yeah, for bypass lines, um, we are, um, the, the product is at cost. So whatever the producer, whatever their cost is, is what's presented. We, um, we charge uh, based on, um, we have a sliding scale. It's just based on your, you know, where you are as far as your business is concerned from a local perspective. Um, if, so from a uh, per transaction, um, if that model doesn't work, we also have a subscription where there's, there's no transaction fees and you get, um, it's a per month charge. And when you, you know, when uh, the, the amount ends up being no more than about $2 a, a, a day or a dollar a day, um, uh, when, you, when you think about it. So it's, uh, it's incredibly, uh, we try to be as, a, as, as affordable for the producer as possible or for um, the merchant as possible, because it's not, uh, we want them to have the level of innovation that uh, the bigger guys have. Without the um, without the heavy lifting of uh, of having the cost to do it, so um, that's kind of where we are with that. Uh, is that right, Sharon? Yes. And I, as you were talking, I was um, looking at Connor. Connor's like looking at me. What did I do? <laughs> um, I'm thinking there's an opportunity, and you know, we can talk offline. I know this uh, it's being recorded, and we have participants. Um, but I think there's an opportunity for the app side of things, like the audience that's already in the app, um, having like local economies or local markets and having top boxes, um, a place where you can get uh, or order uh, local um, fruits and vegetables. And in terms of fee, I mean, we wanna get back too. So um, maybe that's something we can talk about offline after the webinar. But I, I well, certainly I was, see I was definitely thinking point. it. I'm happy you mentioned it. So yes, definitely. Hey Connor, uh -huh. you see who the smart person in this partnership is, right? It's kind of <laughs> I didn't have that no, I was thinking, I thought about something, but Sharon, that's why you have good smart people, man. You have, you you deal with smart people, man. Yeah, and you know okay, you, you later. You can access our our website on your phone, but the functionality is not great. We've been interested in an app for so long. Awesome. Yeah, I just pulled it up. It, it certainly serves the purpose, but I just think there's a partnership since we, you know, we're here local and, you know, want to give back. So. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Maddie, for connecting us. Yes. Thank you, Maddie. If no one else got anything from this, I'm happy that there's, a, there's some potential here for us. Yes. <laughs> yes. Us too. Us too. Well, we are, we are talking about emerging local markets, so... Well, if there are no more questions, um, I want to thank each of you, each of you presenters for joining us this evening and delivering such valuable information on um, your businesses and how you work with food producers, farmers. Um, so thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you. Mary. And I would like to say that the digital shelf does have um, some more episodes coming up. The next one will be called um, it's all about e-commerce platforms, which e-commerce platform is best for your business, depending on the stage you're at, um, the product that you sell, 
or the food that you do um, create, we will be discussing in depth uh, e-commerce and we will be joined by um, Marguerite Green from Sprout NOLA. And we will be joined by um, NOLA Cajun, um, Lovey from NOLA Cajun and e-commerce solutions. So if you can, please join us. And thank you all so much for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank Bye you, nice meeting you, Marianne. Good luck with everything. And Thank Connor, you. we have to, I guess we have, we have your email. Do we have your email? I have your email, yeah. Okay, awesome. I'll awesome. drop a line first thing tomorrow morning. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you all. Bye. Thanks, Maddie. Bye. -bye.